Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into this presentation by myself, Mike Waller and Sean Cole, authors of the new guide, Britain's Orchids. Um, so this presentation will be about identifying orchids in leaf. And to be honest, it's just a brief overview just to give you an idea of what to look out for. So uh, we'll start with some, some general tips and ID features, um, and then move on to some of the more uh, difficult species and sort of how to tell those apart. Okay, so one of the first things to uh, consider, which is the most obvious, I think, to begin with, is size. We've got a lizard orchid there on the left, probably forms the largest rosette of any British species, can be enormous, almost cabbage-like, whereas other species, like the burnt orchid there on the right, as you'd expect, forms a very small rosette. It's a small plant. And so you can see here that even in leaf, these species uh, are very, very different in size. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. Next, you'll want to think about structure. So most orchids in the British Isles form what's called a rosette. For those of you that, of you that don't know, that's a circular arrangement of leaves, pretty much flat to the ground. Although as new leaves develop in the middle of the rosette, they tend to be more erect. So like that lady orchid in the top right. However, the Epipactis, Cephalanthra, the Cypripidiums, they form more of a sort of leafy spike where you can see quite a bit of stem. So that's the two major divisions. Next, you want to be looking at things like the number of leaves. So if it's common to a blade, it's likely to only have two leaves, though sometimes they have three. You might want to look at the arrangement of the leaves. So this is particularly useful with the Epipactis, like this broad leaf telebrine on the left. Are the leaves alternate? Are they spiral? Do they form a spiral around the stem? The next thing you might want to consider is the shape of the leaves. Are they long and thin and grass-like, like the, the sorry, Irish ladies' tresses? Uh, more strap-shaped? Are they more oval or elliptical in shape? What are the edges of the leaves like? Are they wavy-edged? Are they nice and straight? Uh, what's the general uh, sort of appearance of the surface? Is it more glossy or matte or rough to touch, in fact? The tips of the leaves are also quite important too. So they might be long and thin and pointed. They could be blunt ended. Are they all the same? Or is there variability from the lower leaves up to the upper leaves? Like again, the broadleaf telebrine we see there, the lower, lowest leaf is quite rounded and blunt ended, whereas the upper leaves are quite pointed and long. Um, the next thing, of course, well, maybe not, of course, but the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is the venation. Now, some species have quite thin, long uh, veins that are quite pale. Others have much thicker veins, like that common tway blood. They will see they have two larger, deep veins at either side of the midrib, which is quite distinctive as well. And the final thing you want to bear in mind is also the time of year that you're looking at your plant, as this can have a big bearing on what the species might be. So here's the annual growth cycle, which we've uh, nabbed from our book, Britain's Orchids. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation in when orchids appear above ground. So these green bars, green columns, are representative of when orchids are, the various species in the British Isles, are in leaf. Now you'll see this, as I say, there's some variation, but there are a subsection of uh, orchid, these ones, which uh, are present above ground throughout the year. These are the overwintering species. So in theory, you can go out at Christmas when there's snow on the ground. Well, maybe there's snow on the ground, but when there's snow on the ground, you can go out and look for these species. So some of them are quite familiar uh, with many of you, I'm sure. Autumn ladies' tresses, bee orchid, lizard orchid, all of these species you can see during the winter months. Now, as I say, the, probably the most familiar to many of you is the bee orchid, which you will have seen in flower. Many of you will have seen it in leaf as well. Very distinctive species, three or four greyish green leaves, often curled to the side, very common, and actually sometimes more obvious than when they're in flower on um, road verges, I mean, you see grassland lawns. Um, the distinctive thing about the bee orchid is also they have this pale uh, midrib vein going down the middle of the leaf, quite distinctive. Uh, and they also have what I like to call a sort of silvery frosting on the upper surface of the leaf. You can't really see it too well on this one, but it's quite distinctive. And what that is, is the upper, the, the upper layer of the leaf, the epidermis, lifting away and trapping air underneath, giving a sort of silvery appearance. But as time goes on, 
because they're an overwintering species, the orchids start to look quite different. So they'll appear above ground in, say, September. You'll see that the plant on the left there was photographed maybe three months after it first appeared above ground. But four months later, the plant on the right is starting to look fairly knackered, basically. The leaves are starting to blacken, the tips beginning to blacken, the leaves are yellowing, essentially because they've been out throughout the entire winter and they're just looking quite tired. So if you're looking at a rosette in, say, spring, in March, April time, and it's looking very fresh, we can, you can probably assume that it's not an overwintering species. And conversely, if you're looking at one that's looking quite tired and knackered, it could be a bee orchid. It might be a lizard orchid, could even be a man orchid, depending on where you are. So being able to identify the condition and the time of year can be really useful for identification. Finally, um, it's worth bearing in mind that many species of orchids can be confused with an equally large number of other wildflowers, other wild plants with which they often associate. One of the real classics are the plantains. So what we have here is a ribwort plantain there on the left, and we've got a bee orchid on the right. At a cursory glance, they can look quite similar, but the most important things to bear in mind are the plantain has many more leaves, of course. Uh, if you, you can't really see it in this photo, but if you were to look a bit closer, you'd see that the plantain has lots of um, quite long whitish hairs. The bee orchid will be hairless. In fact, most of our species, of course, are hairless. Uh, the ribbit plantain, of course, also has these thick veins, furrow-like veins, almost like a corrugated appearance to the leaves, and the bee orchid is rather smoother. So worth bearing these things in mind. If you'd like to look at some of the other um, common doppelganger plants, which can be confused for orchid rosettes, worth popping into um, our book, Britain's Orchids, and having a look in there. So I'm going to hand over to Sean now. He's going to run through some of the more challenging orchid rosettes species and how to separate them. He'll be looking at the green-winged and pyramidal orchids, both in the Anacamptis genus, and they can both look almost identical, but there's a few new key features we've picked up on, which we'll present to you. Uh, and then secondly, he's going to look at two of our common spotted leaf species, the common spotted orchid and the early purple orchid, and how to separate those species in the field. So over to you, Sean. Hi, thanks very much for that, Mike. This is Sean here, the other half of Britain's orchids, as Mike says. So I'm just gonna go on to some more uh, detailed uh, analysis of some wintering rosettes. In this case, a couple of species pairs, starting with green winged orchid and pyramidal orchid. Both of these overwinter and they're both in the same genus so as you might expect they look quite similar especially at this stage um, they are distinguishable though if you start to look closely you can see there from these photographs that green winged at the top there has quite rounded ended leaves which are relatively similar in shape to each other uh, throughout the rosette that you can see there and they have this distinctive upturned projection at the tip of the leaf this is best viewed by holding your hand against the leaf and looking at it slightly from the side shows much more clearly then um, you should be aware though that this feature does disappear as the plant develops uh, you can see it's already blackened in both of the left hand two photographs there uh, so it is useful certainly earlier on at this stage with green winged the leaves are a very dark color compared to pyramidal as well and moving down to pyramidal you can see there yes paler color outward pointing uh, apiculus and um, the other distinctive feature about pyramidal is and often they have narrower leaves than this this one we chose just to show how similar it can be to green winged but often they're much narrower um, and strap like and but they also as with the photograph that you can see there the sides the edges curl up longitudinally uh, making them look even more narrow and then the leaf seems to twist in an arc um, and it gives them quite a curved curled appearance often when several leaves uh, look like that now in addition to these two it should be uh, pointed out that green winged orchid can and does look very much like early purple orchid we're going to cover early purple in a minute early purple usually has dark blotches on the leaves which makes them very distinctive however of course not all early purples have those so when it doesn't 
uh, it does look very similar to green winged however the best uh, advice to give really is that if you see a colony of early purple with blotched leaves etc etc and you see plants that have unblotched leaves they're almost certainly going to be early purples and of course once they do flower they look completely different this species pair with your typical green wing there and a uh, typical pyramidal completely different talking of early purples we've got a comparison with what at this stage again might look very similar to common spotted orchid but of course there you see side by side um, they do look quite different so early purple having this rosette of leaves looking like a star from above quite broad round tipped leaves um, and common spotted having these two rows of leaves um, progressively getting narrower as you go up the plant so you can see if we draw uh, edges around these leaves straight away that the difference in shape between the developing new leaves same on early purple there um, and much more pointed on the second generation of leaves coming out of a common spotted um, we should also point out that of course early purple emerges above ground much earlier than common spotted so if you're looking around in April and you see this kind of effect you're effectively going to have that kind of two stage generate two generation uh, development on an early purple where you've got fresher leaves and older leaves whereas the whole of the rosette of the common spotted will be um, fresh Another feature of common spotted orchid is these distinctive dark edges to the leaves, which early purple orchid never shows. As they develop and turn to buds, they start to look more and more different. You can see there on the left, this kind of bunch of grapes effect on the early purple with very small brats and almost whitish flowers turning purple as they develop. Whereas the common spotted orchid is very leafy on the inflorescence with these distinctive little dark patterned edges on those bracts and the flowers that you can see um, all be in the same colour as they will when they emerge. The leaves on the stems before they flower are also quite distinctive with the early purple sheathing the stem um, and overlapping whereas they're separate on common spotted and uh, spaced along the stem. Once they flower of course they look completely different and both very beautiful in their own right. We think that looking for orchids in the winter as rosettes has a number of positives really. It might seem like quite hard work but if you think about it there's less competing vegetation so they're much easier to spot once you know what you're looking for um, and you can also mark them and then go back later in the season and they'll be much easier to find not only that but you can see what percentage of the population flowers later on when you know how many there were to start with earlier on in the season uh, it's been said before as well in the previous presentation that uh, it may be that uh, new species can be found in new locations there was a lizard orchid found in kent based on its rosette and it was good news for that plant because it was found in the winter and it was protected later on in the season from mowing because it was on a roadside verge. So there are definitely conservation implications for the orchids as well as making life easier for the orchid spotter. So there you have it. Uh, just a little taster of identifying orchids in leaf. Um, if it's a subject you're interested in, you'd like to find out more, don't hesitate to pick up a copy of our new guide, Britain's Orchids, which is available to purchase online and in all good bookshops as well, which has a whole dedicated section to identifying orchids in leaf with lots of annotated pictures and extra ID tips in there too. If you're on social media, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, do please follow us. Um, but you can just send us an email as well. We are keen to get comments, thoughts, constructive criticism, because it will all go to making the second edition of the book even better. So thanks for tuning in again and enjoy the rest of the exhibition meeting. Bye bye.